This is Patrick Russell. I'm inter interviewing Antone Lackey for the first time. This interview is taking place on August the 8th, 2021 in Norman, Oklahoma. This interview is being conducted by the Making History Project. How are you doing today, Antone? I'm doing fine, sir. All right. And uh, what is your date of birth? February the 17th. 1927. No, February 16, 1927. All right. And where were you born? Geary, Oklahoma. And can you tell me what what your hometown was like when you were growing up? Oh, it, I just I'm always busy. I, I had uh, penis to hoe out or cotton corn something. I never I never stayed in the house. I was with my dad. But what was your hometown like? Was it a big town, a farm no. town? Uh, Gary is this little town. How many people? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Is it mostly farming? It's all farming. Okay. And how big was your family growing up? I had uh, four sisters and a little brother. Okay. And. Where were you in that order? I was number one. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, that's why I had to work and help uh, feed them. Uh huh. And they got your hand me downs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, what did your parents do? My parents, uh, my mother, she took in washings. And Dad and I done the farming. We had Grandpa's 40 acres, and uh, we had cattle on it. And I had two uh, two cows I had milk every morning and night. And what type of farming did you do? We just we had six or seven cows, and then we had. Oh, I think it was 20 acres of alfalfa. Made their own hay and everything. Then we planted wheat, barley, and all that. Barley, oh, uh, in those years, uh, you got where you couldn't get coffee. And mother could, uh, we had barley, and mother could take and burn that barley and then make coffee out of it. And if you, it's a different coffee, it ain't, it ain't got the wing to it. Mm -hmm. But you miss the boat if you never drank uh, car, uh, coffee made out of burnt barley. Was it good? Oh, dang, I liked it. Then I had to go into the military when I was 17 and get used to their darn coffee. And, um,. And your father was a farmer. Yeah. All right. And how did you do the plowing of your fields? Do you have tractors? Uh, mostly mules. I, I had a pair of mules. Dad never made enough money to buy an old farm all yet. So you did it by hand? <laughs> we done it by hand. Hand and horses? Yep. Dad didn't like me working horses because a, a, a darn rattlesnake would rattle out in the field. And a set of horses would take off, and he didn't want me falling off the elevator and getting run over. And so I had me a pair of mules. <laughs> a pair of mules. A rattlesnake would rattle back there, and the old mule I'd, I'd watch him. And pretty soon he'd get his eyeball on before that snake was. And boy, when he hit that snake with my high foot, that snake was there. So he would step on him. Yeah, boy, he could knock him for a wing. And during the horse, he'll run off. Um, so you went to school? Uh, yeah, clear up to, let's see, I graduated. And then when I come back from the military, 
I went one year high school. And then went back in the military. Okay, well, how far did you make it in school before you joined the military? I got all the way through the eighth grade. Eighth grade, yeah. okay. And how old were you when you joined the military? I was 17. Okay, and when did you join the military? What year? Uh, in February. Of what year? About, uh, let's see. February. So 1944. Something like that. Okay. So it was when, when, uh, when the war started broke. I was the oldest boy in the family, and it, it was a family tradition. The oldest boy always went to war. All right. So you were in eighth grade. You had an eighth grade education. You joined the military at age 17 yeah. in World War II. Yeah. Before doing that, did you have any type of hobbies or sports that you liked as a kid? No. No? Just farming? Just farming. <laughs> what about hunting or fishing? No. No? Uh, Dad once in a while would take a gun out and get us a deer. All right. And before we talk about your military, I want you to tell me about your hat. A hat. Yeah, tell me about that hat. That's a That's really cool hat. That's to me when I graduated out of school for Fort Riley, Kansas. It was about my third or fourth one I've had. This is the newest one. All right, so this is a cavalry hat. Oh, yeah. All right. And man, I'm so proud to wear it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so you, you enlisted into the Army for World War II, right? Yes. All right, now, how did your family feel about you joining the Army during well, World War II? Mother didn't care about it, but see, and our Irish family and everything, when, when your country goes to war, the oldest son always goes in. And I was the oldest son. And the, the dad always went by the old traditions from the old country. And what's the old country? Ireland. Ireland. And over there, the oldest boy in the family. Any kind of war, he's in it. He, I, I'm always proud that I didn't have the draft to draft me. My country asked me to serve. I, I was ready to serve my country. And there's a very few draftees can say that. And what branch of service did you join? I was with the 1st Cavalry Division. U.S. Army. Yeah. And uh, do you remember what regiment or battalion you belonged to? 8th Regiment. All right. And where did you go for basic training? Basic training was at Fort Riley, Kansas. And what was basic training like for you? Oh, we just uh, rode our horses through the regular training outfit and we'd come up on a on a target and then we'd have to slide off from a horse and go in and cut his throat. Well, it's shooting at us. But they had dummies so that we do that. And later on by asking questions they had a tuba chicken <laughs> and we got that through, and then we got that blood on us, and it showed we completed our course. So, for basic training, they already, already immediately assigned you to the cavalry? Horse cavalry. All right, and. Because I was in the horse cavalry before that. Okay. And. So, you already knew how to ride a horse? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I guess you're pretty good at it? Oh, yes. <laughs> and how many people are in your horse cal cavalry? Uh, how many you. are you training with? Well, I was trained with 42. Was, yeah, man, everybody got their own horse. And <laughs> forget that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what role would, would horse cavalry have in World War II with tanks? 
what were you guys going to do? When the tanks come in? Yeah, what were you, like, I'm wondering what role did you have? Uh, they take and put most of us in, in them. When the tanks come in, put us in the tanks. Okay. Took our horses and put us in tanks. Me, I was always perfect shot on everything I took. I never missed a target. And man, they put me in military police. So you were a perfect target while on a horse? He, yeah. And you're talking about shooting, what, a rifle? Yeah, it was, it was my 45 and going back with that, that old Springfield, old five Springfield rifle. All right, so there came a point where eventually they put you into the military police. Yeah. Okay. Because they, need, they needed uh, somebody to police things. And that was a good enough shot, and I wasn't afraid. <laughs> I'd already shot one man, and I wasn't backing down. Uh, we had a fella, he went AWOL. And he went up to uh, uh, a little town, five or two. And uh, they sent me up there, and that guy jumps up in front of me. And he says, there's no damn tower, man, go and take me back to camp. I'm out of there. I'm not going back. And then I give him an uppercut, put him down on the ground, dallied the rope around his feet, and got back on my horse and drug his ass into camp. The back side of him had all his shirt and all his hide pillow wore off, had two or three bloody spots on him. You dragged him literally? <laughs> so you were like an old cowboy. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't going to have him up there. He had already took a swing at me. I wasn't going to have him sitting back there for back of me on my horse. <laughs> All right. So um, basic training. You're training with horses. Training. You're training like infantry on a horse, right? Oh yeah. Uh, 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 horse infantry. And then. How long was your basic training? Uh, first time, we were eight weeks. Did you do then some advanced training? Eight weeks. Now, did you do some additional training after that? Later on, for uh, special jobs. Okay, and what type of training did you do afterwards? Well, I went to uh, military police school. And, uh, you know, arrest a man and everything. Find out how that was done. Okay. And how long did that last? Military police school was, was four weeks. And what did you do next? Huh? What did you do next? A after that? Oh, I just uh, chase AWOLs, and somebody went <laughs> <with> AWOL. <laughs> well, hell, I had to go get him or him back. And where were you doing this? All over the country. They, they assigned you to specific bases? No, uh, my specific base was um, the camp up there just above us, uh, 50. Two, I think, is the name of it. And so when you were doing this, you're in the United States? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, sometimes I had to go out of the States to uh, get AWOLs. I've been in, I've been pretty near every country there is who got different boys from different countries. And they always try to get home when they go AWOL. All right, so was that your specialty, to go chase AWOLs? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Boy, when, they, when somebody went AWOL, <laughs> that was my next assignment. <laughs>
<laughs> now you're not always doing that on a horse though, right? No, uh, I was doing that on the back of your foot. Okay. And and would you do this by yourself or did you have a uh, backup? No, I didn't have no backup. Just you? Just me. All right. Anyway, they didn't have no suspicions and just one guy showed up and I was asked, telling them I was lost and I wanted to know where I was at. <laughs> I had a different spiel that I could give them. And man, they, they was AWOL too, so they got right with me, got real friendly, and I find out what I need to know. And so you would say that you were AWOL? Yeah. Make them, you know, know that they weren't by themselves. I'd get, I'd get them real interested in me and everything, and then I'd ask them to put their hands out there together like that where I could drop the handcuffs on. Did you end up getting into a fair amount of fights? Huh? Did you have to get into a fair amount of fights? Oh yeah, once in a while I had to take and give a guy a nipper cut. I learned how to hit when I was in the first scale division. They, they taught me how to hit a guy underneath the jaw here with your fist and twist it just a little bit, put the guy right out. <laughs> um, did you ever deploy overseas as part of World War II? Uh, I went over when um, we was oh, about halfway through the war or so. Then came home. They made me. They, Anton, your permit. They military police don't let them tell you you're anything else. But you're permanent. When you were, when you deployed, where did you go in World War Two? Huh? Where did you go in World War Two? Overseas. Uh, we was in Osaka, Japan. We was in uh, in uh, Tokyo. Oh, I had a lot of fun in Tokyo. <laughs> what did you do in Tokyo? That was so much fun. Huh? What did you do in Tokyo? That was so much fun. Well, the girls were real friendly. Uh, these girls here, they, they pretty run from you. But uh, real friendly girls, and they'd come into the kitchen. I was uh, was the uh, uh, head chef, uh, run the kitchen and everything. And it's uh, Mr. Lackey. Tomorrow we we got to be uh, on the road, and uh, you're you're. Uh, uh, my uh, the guy that's going to relieve me would be in in an hour or two, and then I could get ready to go. And boy, we'd go into different countries. When you okay. were when you were in Japan, what were you doing? Were you still military police? Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, every time when I was in Japan, I had to go after somebody. I had to take a new military police with me to show him how to drop him down on his knees, get him handcuffed, and if I had to, drag his ass home. <laughs> he didn't want to ride in the Jeep. So when you were in Japan, this was during the occupation after occupation World War II. Occupation of Japan. Before the occupation, where did you deploy overseas? Uh, I was in the Philippines. I was only in there for about 90 days. And same thing, military police? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they like the way I handled things. And they wouldn't give me no, <laughs> no really kind of military job. 
right? Uh, You're kind of like the sheriff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I was asked to be the sheriff when they came home. El Reno, they begged me to sign, to, uh, sign over for the sheriff there. Uh, hell no, I don't want no civilian sheriff's job. You guys, you get you 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 get lawsuits against you and everything, and I'm not used to that. <laughs> I was that close to being a military policeman here in El Reno. All right, and then um, how long were you in the military for? Oh. I got a partial discharge back in oh, 84 or 85. So you were in for a really long time. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't fully released. I was, on, I was released on condition of being recalled. Okay, and... Um, <laughs> And um, what did you do in the military after World War II? After World War II, oh, I, uh, I, uh, World War II, oh, Eisenhower had to be brought home. And they didn't have no, uh, military police. So I had to go get him and you were bringing back and he had to report to uh, our camp five in Korea. And I took him in there and then took him out of there and brought him back to Washington. Eisenhower. Eisenhower. All right. So you were like part of Eisenhower's bodyguard? Oh I was it. Eisenhower, so yeah. General Eisenhower, mm -hmm. Allied Commander. Mm -hmm. All right. And did you meet him? Huh? Did you meet him? Yeah, yeah. I was I ate my meals with him and I slept in bed away from him a little ways. And so how was General Eisenhower? He was all right. He says now, Anton, you're not you're not doing your job, but I said, well, General, what are you talking about? And he says, you see this bowl of twine? You tie it to my bed, and then you tie it to your bed. Well, it'll jerk you if I, if I wake up in the middle of the night. So you'll know where I'm wandering off to. And I have that damn uh, string from his bedroll out across the grass there and everything over to my bedroom. And if he ever got up in the middle of the night, well, hell, <laughs> he'd pull that string and I'd be up. So you did that? Yeah. You did that? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. And he, he, he wanted that me to know that he was up and wandering around. What was your most memorable conversation with General Eisenhower? Uh... We discussed the damn Democrats in this country and their, uh, their uh, thinking of taking this country someday, which when uh, Biden stole the election from uh, uh, Trump and he went in for presidency, it all come true to what we, discussed, what we talked about. Chris, Biden, he don't have no idea. All he wants is, uh, is friends to vote for him. And foreign uh, people are coming in here from foreign countries to enjoy our freedom. And it ain't right. Kids are coming in here for the schooling. Did there come a time where you worked with uh, General Douglas MacArthur? Yeah, I was with MacArthur. Uh, he was in Korea when I got in Korea. 
And did you have to provide like bodyguard services for him? Oh yeah. All right. So, what was he like? Like oh, oh damn, you couldn't ask for a better man. Boy, uh, he he was my best. He was one of the better generals that I guarded. And why? Well, he just he would tell me he. Uh, by having MacArthur my first bodyguard, to, he, he'd uh, tell me different things to watch for. Or that neither one of us would get captured. So he was telling you how to do your job? Well, he was uh, training me, is what he's saying. But that was all right, because I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> 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 And um, did he have his corn cob pipe? Oh damn, that smelly thing! Oh shit, <laughs> man, man, be better off uh, plowing cotton behind a pair of mules. It'll smell that damn corn cob pipe. Oh, that stuff. And what was your most memorable moment with General Douglas MacArthur? MacArthur. Oh. I'm telling you, he was strictly army. When, it, when, when there was three of you uh, walking into town or anything, you had to be in step with each other. You could not be out of step. Anytime there was three boys walking together, they had to be in step. Man. So discipline. Yeah, discipline. And, Hey, we'd better not get back to camp and, and somebody and that local police turned in. We we weren't in step. And what were the differences between General Eisenhower and General MacArthur? Uh, Eisenhower, he was too damn strict. Man, I mean, you better be where you're supposed to be whenever he's seen you. And uh, you could never get too far from him when you was his bodyguard. Now MacArthur, he didn't give a damn. <laughs> Now, you were with MacArthur when he was in Korea. Yeah. Um, there, uh, came, there came a point where he was, um, his command was taken away from him. MacArthur, yeah. yeah. Were you there for that? Yeah. And uh, tell me about that. How did he take that? Uh, that woman that was top woman in this country when MacArthur was uh, uh, a parent with the president. Oh, what was her name? She was the top woman. And she was an honorary old bitch. And, man, we, we had to be careful what we said, where we was at, or what we were doing. Because she did not like him. <laughs> I said, MacArthur. I said, the hell she do to that woman? Well, he says, then don't what does a 17-year-old kid do to a woman? That's <laughs> always a bugging him. <laughs> I said, well, I get the picture then. Oh, boy, she's after your ass. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so when, when he was recalled and relieved of his command, how did he take that? Uh, uh, when he got his command came from him, he says, now, by and damn, they can take and shove things, uh, shove the country up their ass, do whatever they damn please, because I am a free man. 
and there's nobody going to tell me when to check and get off the pot. Those were his words? Yeah, it was his words to me. I'll never forget that first time I'd ever heard them. Yeah. Now, is it true that, that General MacArthur wanted to keep on going after the Chinese during the Korean War? We was wanting to take him out. I was with him. And what did he, did he say why, or what, what was his motivation? Well, the Chinese had no business in there stirring the pot. By stirring the pot was getting the Chinese people riled up about America wanting to take a whole country. And Obviously, the president at the time disagreed with that policy. Yeah, he, he didn't, he, we didn't need to be uh, uh, fighting the Chinese in China. We need to be home taking care of our own business. And that's the way he put it. <laughs> and they, did, they didn't care for MacArthur ever since. Boy, when he told them <laughs> what he thought of them, he, he was done with him. When MacArthur told who? Uh, uh, Are we talking about Truman? Truman. Okay. Well, uh, what he told Truman, what he thought of him. Man, it was all over with that. Truman was after him. <laughs> Did you ever see Eisenhower and MacArthur speak to each other? Uh, just for a few minutes. Did they get along with each other? Oh yeah, but as long as you didn't put any pressure on any one of them. Everything was, you know, normal. And so how long were you with MacArthur? With MacArthur. Uh, I was with MacArthur uh, when we first went in Korea. I was his bodyguard about two years before that. And then we went to Korea. Okay. Man, it was interesting. Did uh, General MacArthur ever stay in contact with you after Korea? Yeah. He did? Yeah. He then uh, he let them bloody bastards stay and get, get you caught most your dead. <laughs> and that's his no Mac. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Everything had to be bloody. You let them bloody bastards get your court martial set. <laughs> that was his favorite word, bloody? <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget that. <laughs> but MacArthur and me, we were, we were good buddies who understood each other. And, man. But we met each other. Who did you get along with better, MacArthur or Eisenhower? MacArthur and me got along. Everybody was on, on his ass, and I, I was telling him, just don't worry about it. You're doing your job, and you're all right. But uh, MacArthur, oh hell, he, at, at times he says, Anton, there's something wrong. You let me know, and we'll take care of it. <laughs> And I didn't want to get nobody fired, so I wouldn't say no more to it. Who else did you meet? What other generals did you meet? Uh, Perishing. I just got to see him oh, three or four times. But when he came back from Europe, he, 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 he came in just to tour the country, see what was going on. Me dies now, and then he got back to his country. But, oh, I had a lot of fun. Did you ever meet General Patton? Yeah. 
Yeah. How was he? He was all right. Now, he was in the Pacific when I, I was in there with the uh, 8th Cavalry. We, we had our horses took away from him. And Patton, he was the uh, commander. So this was early? Huh? This was early in the war then? Oh yeah, back in the 40s. Hmm. Uh, 40, 45 I believe, when I got to see him. Okay. Pretty sure it was 45. And what was your most memorable moment from World War II? My most memorable moment? From World War II. Yeah, from World War II. World War II. When we landed in uh, Yokohama, Japan, and I mean, they, 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 they got uh, Japanese with six hundred flies in there, and damn. We were killing them bastards. I don't know. How come we couldn't get them thinned out? Because they're still pretty thick. That was the worst I've seen. It was when we were in Korea. In Korea? Yeah. Went in there to get the damned. Um, Chinese out of Korea. Korea was asking and the begging us. He even had their, a Chinese in Washington uh, talking to the commanders there. And they wanted us in there and run the damned uh, Japanese out of there. Was it the, are you talking about the North Koreans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'd come down in there and they, and hell, they were taking over China. They were going in there. Yeah. Eisenhower, and they, Eisenhower, he looked, I remember him at, at telling that one Chinese general, he says, now, you don't want a bunch of them damn half breed Chinese kids. And, in, in, in um, out, of, out of South Korea, Korean kids, I says, they can get them out and get them sent home. <laughs> Man. Oh, man. That war is something else. And what did you do after your military service? After my military service, mm -hmm. I stayed in the reserves. And, uh, oh, horse cavalry. We had problems here, I don't remember. But we had problems here. Care of them. We're in the hell. And we took care of that. And when I got that straightened up, oh man. What other jobs did you do? Uh, just military jobs I ever had. Just military? The whole time? Okay. I, uh, I, uh, oh, 64, I 
I, I was with uh, MacArthur in 64. And uh, when uh, the Koreans was trying to take China, we had quite a bit of, and we had a Chinese war with them. And, uh, man, that would have been 54, right? It was before that. Yeah. Uh, it was in uh, 48 or 49. All right. Is there anything you would like to tell future generations? Any words of advice or wisdom? Any wisdom? Yeah. Is just keep your nose out of other people's business. It does not concern you. And pay attention to uh, the people that's running the country. And help them when you can help them. That would be my only way. All right. Your help is what makes America strong. We're all working together. Yep. Can you put your hat on for the final? Yeah. <laughs> put that old cavalry hat back on. Is it? It's on straight. Yeah. All right, Anton. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me today and share your stories. They're very interesting. Um, very fascinating that you met both General Eisenhower and General MacArthur, and you were their bodyguards. Um, I want to thank you for your long and distinguished military service. I'm still in there. <laughs> You're still ready to go, huh? Yeah. Uh, uh, I am, um, um, oh, I had a club, they call it. When, when, you, when you're out and you're a whole lot like on parole, you can be called back any time. Yeah. All right. And if they need somebody to kick ass, just call me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. When I, when I told Patton that, <laughs> Patton liked to die laughing. He says, damn man, don't you a horny little boy. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. I said, when you need somebody, just call Anton. I'll be there to kick ass for you. <laughs> oh, Patton, he never forgot that. He told all of these officers that. <laughs> Ooh, I was a horny little old kid though, when I was 18. <laughs> I didn't have a sense of God give goose. <laughs> All right, thank you, Anton. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, but I've always been there.